Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Mike Wills Podcast. This is the Dog Days of Podcasting edition for August 5th, 2019. I am WX0MIK and my name is Mike Wills. This season we are covering amateur or ham uh, radio. So the last few episodes we talked about some electrical electrical components. We talked about um, just what is ham radio in general now we get uh, now we start diving into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of I'll say a little bit more important when it comes to radio because it, we're talking about propagation, uh, which is the distribution of of signal pretty much, um, antennas and feed lines. So this is the part where we actually get into you know rubber hits meets the road so to speak of how to make your radio work. Um, so the first chapter we are talking about, and I'm just using the book this time rather than some of my notes. Um, so chapter 4.1, at least in the, um, fourth edition of the book, I'll just call it fourth edition, um, covered in 4.1 is called Propagation. First, they talk uh, about uh, what I've mentioned in, before, that radio waves spread out from antenna in straight lines unless reflected or diffracted along the way, just like light. So, you know, you shine a light and sometimes it'll bounce off or do weird things based on what you're hitting. Um, And then at some point, the radio wave will become too weak um, because we receive because it has just spread out so much or it has been absorbed or scattered or whatever. And that's what they typically call your range. Um, sometimes you have obstructions such as buildings, hills, things like that. That's called shadowing. Um, and that's, uh, rarely prevalent in UHF and VHF frequencies. Uh, you can have also issues with vegetation like trees and so on that those will typically absorb. Um, but then on the plus side in winter, at least in the Northern part of the, um, continent, if you want to uh, go that route, uh, there's no leaves on trees. So you're more likely to get a, a greater range in winter because it's not, the vegetation is not absorbing that. Um, fog and rain can also absorb uh, microwave and UHF radio waves. Um, although typically with HF and the lower HF bands, you don't have as much issue Uh, From experience, normally I have a very strong signal to our VHF repeater. And in very heavy rain, I'll uh, have very weak signal. So it still can affect it. It's just not as likely and you'll have a little better chance of signal. And I'm working off a little handheld, which technically, you know, isn't that strong. If I was to use a 50-watt radio, I'd have much better signal in heavy rain for the VHF-type stuff. They also talk uh, describe what knife-edge refra- diffraction is. It's just a different way of um, how radio signals will bounce off an edge and kind of scatter it a little bit. They also talk about how it can uh, c- come through what they call multipath. So let's say you're bouncing off a building or something, you could potentially be coming in, bouncing off, basically you're bouncing it off of something, or you could be receiving from multiple paths into the same radio, and that can cause this multipath type um, interference, if you want to call it that. Let's see here. They also talk about a picket fencing or mobile flutter. Um, That can happen when you're moving in a uh, vehicle. So that, um, so that's uh, something else that they talk about. There's a couple of questions related to all of this information. 
Um, and then they talk about they um, they start to bring into here something that they call the tropospheric propagation or just tropo, which tropospheric pro- propagation then would be um, probably the best way to describe it is like a duct. So you can uh, it's almost like um, putting it on a directional antenna and you're focusing it in a certain direction. So the signal just kind of bounces in this like a little duct. And then a lot of times you can get much, much longer um, contacts. And I don't remember the distance, but they uh, made a world record uh, contact at 2,500 miles or something like that. I forgot exactly what it is. But what they figure was the weather was such that um, the heat, at a, a certain height that wasn't overly far from the, that wasn't very far from the the ocean. It was bouncing the radio waves back into the, the ocean where salt water is a very uh, reflective. So it was just kind of bouncing up and down until it hit um, its location. I'll try and find that article and share that within this, sto- uh, the show notes here. Uh, it's kind of interesting just to see, what kind of weird things the earth, I guess, can do. Uh, the next thing they introduce you to is the ionosphere. Um, this re- uh, region is about 30 to 260 miles above the earth. Uh, they talk about how it gets energized, and they talk about the different layers, uh, which are D, E, F1, and F2. Uh, D layer being the lowest, Um and the pain pond, whether it's the night, whether it's night or day, and the intensity of solar radiation, these different layers can reflect or ref- refract or absorb these radio waves. Uh, especially when they're talking about these, they're talking more about the HF type signals. But there are other, um, uh, usually VHF, UHF, they will cut through the ionosphere. And um, a little note on that. I know the uh, Apollo 13 landing was just recent. No, Apollo 11. Apollo 11. Um, the Apollo 11, uh, I was doing a little research of uh, how do they communicate? And from what I have seen, in most cases, they're using bands within the VHF and UHF ranges. And on a second side note related to that, they used a lot of different repeaters within that whole computerized system in order to ensure communication. So each astronaut had a radio, um, like the the mobile car thing, whatever you want, to, uh, whatever it was called, the, the the lunar vehicle had a repeater built into that. The um, there was multiple repeaters built into the radio or into the um, landing module. Um, there was a repeater on the um, I'll call it the spacecraft that was uh, orbiting the moon to relay information back to Earth. So they were using a whole bunch of series of different repeaters and different radio paths in order to, to get communications from the moon all the way back to Earth. Continuing on. So then uh, one thing that they point out in uh, the the tech book is that long-distance contacts are typically in the HF bands, and this ionospheric propagation is the most common way that you, they can make long-distance contacts. Um, there is also, in uh, the general book, they talk about the long path, which, if you hit it lucky, you can literally bounce your radio signal around the world and go right back into your station. It takes all all of about 0.7 seconds, so you got to be really quick if you want to try and catch it or have multiple radios running. That's if you're lucky. Uh, In recent uh, months, days, um, I think for some people it feels like months, the solar, um, the sun hasn't been overly... um, helpful in doing long-range propagations. Um, And there's a such thing as solar weather. No, I have not gone down that road yet. But um, 
that is a thing they do cover a little bit about that at the higher levels because you're they're, they're assuming that you're working much more in the hf bands technician is much more like a summary um and then they talk about how like uhf signals they are they only bend a little and they're typically lost in the space so that's um why you can't use like uhf signals to bounce uh vhf is a little bit different i think it's vhf you can bounce them off certain um you can bounce them off various things oh here we're talking about right here at all points or at points of the ions at the solar cycle uh there are patches of the ionosphere's e layer that can become sufficiently ionized to reflect vhf and uhf signals back to earth this is called sporadic e um that's most common during early summer and midwinter months on 10 6 and occasionally 2 meters <clears throat> You're not using your handheld or your mobile radio to do this. This is um, typically you're um, using bigger radios for that type of stuff. And then I think probably directional is part of that as well. Um, they talk about uh, you can do like a bouncing signal off of a meteor or a meteor tail of ionic. Ionis, ionis, ionized, you know what I'm trying to say, gas. <laughs> uh, that can last up to several seconds. A lot of those type of things, you're like, boom, you have like a couple seconds. Not that I have experience with that right now. Um, the other thing that they talk about, and this kind of related to more when you get into the uh, UHF, they talk about the highest frequency signal uh, that can be reflected back to a point on Earth. It's called the maximum usable frequency, and that thus there's also a minimum usable frequency. Um, and then, if there, uh, if it's possible between the two points, it's said to be open. If not, it's closed. Um, and a lot of people have been doing um, a certain digital mode as they are experimenting or as they're trying to do these long distance um, contacts. But unfortunately, the sun hasn't been cooperating lately and the bands have been pretty much closed. <clears throat> um, uh, the, the technology or the digital mode they're using is called FT8. And... I myself don't know much about it, but supposedly it's pretty low bandwidth to where they have been able to successfully make long distance contacts, even though pretty much the bands are closed right now. It's usually the case where you can still make HF contacts. It's just usually much more local because either you're propagating off to the sides or you can potentially get that bounce back if you go straight up and then it'll bounce right but straight back down so yeah that is talking about propagation and there's a lot of interesting things associated with that as you dive deeper and deeper into ham radio um, if all you're doing is little handhelds you just have to remember I gotta talk to a repeater or you can do simplex mode and you have to make sure that you can basically have a line of sight to some up to some amount of degree. So um, we are going to wrap it up here. And then uh, tomorrow we will talk about antenna and radio wave basics. Uh, that's going to be a little more exciting, I believe. We'll start talking about how to measure them. And then um, I will go into differences of different coaxes in the next couple days and so on. So I will talk to you tomorrow. This is WX0MIK and yes, I did get approved by the way. Uh, signing off. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK 73.